Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to Upkick MMA episode 319. I am Brendan. UFC Fight Night, Sirogan versus Sergey Spivak. All right, we're going to cover the main card here. We're going to break down all the fights round by round, go over the scorecards, talk about UFC France, I think this was. Officially, we're so we're going to talk about that stuff real quick before we start getting into the fights. If you like this kind of thing, you like fights about, or you like <laughs> the channels that talk about fights, you like MMA, you like podcasts about MMA, that kind of stuff. I break down fights here, two or three videos every single week, breaking them down. Subscribe to the channel so you know the next video is coming out. Let's get started. Okay, <clears throat> timestamps are down below for every fight. Uh, Cyril Gon taking on Sergey Spivak. So these are the heavyweights. This is the main event here. Oh boy, um, not a competitive one. Uh, spoilers, <laughs> it's not not competitive competitive in the least. Uh, Gon was bouncing light on his feet, um, staying on the outside, using the jab. Uh, Gon was using the left straight to the body. Spivak, he landed a hard loop and left hook at one point in this first round. Uh, Spivak was deep on a single, but Gon sprawled, made him pay with some knees to the body. Uh, Gon was able to just stand in front of him, throw whatever he wanted. Spivak just stood there, just shelled up for most of this, and it was, you know, one-way traffic. Gon was moving, literally, he was... He was moving literally just poking and prodding laterally, not literally. I wrote it down, and I know how to spell. I just, I'm an idiot. <laughs> um, uh, oh, I got to move my camera. I was messing around with stuff. It was really weird. It, it seemed like Spivak just was, I don't know if it was paralysis by analysis or, he, you know, I thought he was just over, he, he seemed like he was just overwhelmed, and he just, didn't do anything. It was so crazy. So crazy. Uh, in the second round here, Gon was using the front kick to the body, low kicks, and keeping that jab out there. If you look at the striking numbers here from the first round, fifty-one to seven in favor of Gon. It's not even close, and that's significant strikes. I think most of them were significant. Yeah, fifty-two of fifty-two total strikes. So fifty-one out of those fifty-two were significant. And then in the second round, just more of the same. Spivak was just standing there with his guard up, not throwing anything. Gone landing whatever he wanted, a hard knee to the body and a hard right hand up top for Cyril. And then, you know, he, he just, he, he he put on the volume and put him away. 58 to four in the second round for significant strikes in favor of Gone. Again, not even close. It was, honestly, it was really weird. I was kind of worried that something happened to Spivak. Not worried for his health or anything. I was worried that we weren't seeing the best, but it might just be that Sirogan is that good. And he looked, he looked great. Oh my God. I haven't looked at the ranking since he became champion. <laughs> seeing his red hair on here. Oh my goodness. That is funny. Mm. All right. Heavyweights. So what does this mean for Sirogan? Losing the title fight to John Jones, not the worst thing in the world. John Jones has to fight Stipe because reasons. It's not that I don't think that Stipe has earned it with his career. It's just there's guys like Tom Aspinall, some newer guys. I'd like to see fight John Jones before John Jones inevitably retires here. And this is stuff I want to see. So it's me being a little bit selfish and more trying to rush them into a title shot to try and get John Jones some interesting matchups before we throw Stipe, or not before we throw Stipe, but instead of just giving him Stipe and then letting him retire or you know sail off into the sunset that way, I kind of just want to see interesting fights. He's not the most active fighter. So Gon probably will take on Aspinall. I mean, he just beat number seven. I mean, who else is there? There's, um, I mean, Volkov is fighting soon. Who else did we had? We had, I thought Alexander Romanov. Sergey Pavlovich, number one. There we go. I was like, where the heck is the other Sergey? Well, Pavlovich should be fighting for a title. But why isn't he going to be fighting for one? Well, because we're waiting for Miocic. So I'd, I would just rather see Pavlovich fight John Jones just to get it out of the way so we can make sure like, oh yeah, you know, that's how good John Jones is or maybe Pavlovich will surprise us and be like, oh wow, Pavlovich is really good. And even if Pavlovich loses to John Jones, then when we move on past the John Jones era, we realize like, okay, Pavlovich will is really, he's really good. But 
part of the reason why light heavyweight It, the passing of the torch was almost there, and it was just this weird situation when John Jones left light heavyweight, right? Because when he left, he had some really close fights back to back. <clears throat> so he had some really close fights in which either were split decision wins or a dis- unanimous decision win, which a lot of people thought he lost. And then immediately after he's gone, those those people that he had close fights with get demolished by other fighters in the division and don't even become champions themselves. So there's this lingering question, would John Jones have beaten them? And you know, the easy answer for a lot of people is, Oh dude, bro, come on. John Jones is so much better than them. Well, if he's so much better, why wasn't he putting people away like that? Why was he having these like Tiago Santos? Like why, why was that fight so close when Santos blew out both of his knees? Hmm? Why was that a split decision win? Right, so you look at this stuff and you, like Dominic Reyes, the Dominic Reyes fight. They were so close. And and a lot of people thought that Reyes won that fight. So how do you justify John Jones leaving and then saying, oh, well, uh, Jan Blachowicz wouldn't have stood a chance against John Jones. Uh, how do you know that? Because he barely, he, 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 he skated by against Reyes. He went the distance with Anthony Smith. It's it's not that I don't think I think that John Jones isn't good. He obviously is. It's at heavyweight. I don't want the same thing to happen. I don't want it to there to be lingering questions. I'd like to have him have him have either a close fight against a contender, right, or have him lose and then move on. I mean, if he if he just blows out the division, then so be it. But if he just fights Miocic and then leaves. Or fights Miocic, waits for two years, and then fights an age another aging person. Let's say I don't know, pick pick an aging heavyweight that finally gets on a three fight win streak or something. Like God for God forbid, Andre Olovsky goes on a five fight win streak or some crap. Like who knows? Crazier things have happened, and we see him fight that person and then retire. Well, and then in, in meanwhile, we've got like Pavlovich, uh, you know, he's already, he has already fought Ciro Gan. Fair enough. Um, but looking at the rankings here, you got Tom Aspinall, who looks like a, a banger, um, crazy, crazy talented. Curtis Blades, I think he wins that fight. As much as I love Curtis, I think his time, you know, it's just, I've, I've said my piece on him before. I think he's excellent. I think he's one of the best heavyweights in the world. It's just his chin and it, yeah, oh God, he just doesn't have a heavyweight chin. That's all. That's what it comes down to. I think he's an excellent fighter. Like I said, one of the best in the world. One of the best heavyweights in the world. He just doesn't have a heavyweight chin. Not a lot of people do. It's not his fault. And then you got uh, Sergei Spivak, who who just lost. So I don't know if he would be. But Alexander Volkov would be interesting because he's so tall. You know, maybe he gets taken down and dominated on the ground. But he has picked up his tons of people. You're gonna tell me tons of people wouldn't want to see him versus Derek Lewis. You know, for the five seconds that Derek Lewis tries in that fight, I think people would be extremely excited for that. You know, seeing him even against a freak show fight like Alexander Romanov, this giant wrestler of a guy, do I think he would lose against Romanov? No, I think Romanov would get get taken care of. It's just... Or Jayotan Almeida, you know, this crazy grappler. Like, he's he's on a tear too. There's plenty of people at heavyweight that make for very interesting fights right now. And... We are in a situation where John Jones is going to sit there and wait it out and, you know, all power to him for being the most successful, one of the most successful fighters in history. And a lot of people think he's the greatest and whatever. It's just when you hold it up a division like this and then you kind of, you, you leave it in limbo and then you take off. We've seen it before. It takes some time for that division to build up some steam and people to think that there's a worthwhile challenge in there. The fact that John Jones is champion has kind of not saved heavyweight, but given it some, uh, not relevance, but uh, legitimacy since Ngannou left, because a lot of people think that, you know, John Jones could easily beat Ngannou. And people wanted to see that fight, obviously, but skill for skill, obviously, John Jones, it stands a chance more, not stands a chance, uh, probably wins that fight. That being said, all this stuff, uh, what, Cyril Gan taking on Tom Aspinall is fine. 
I would just rather see. Tom, I don't know. I, I like I said my piece on it. We can move on now. I, I I really think that the the division is in a decent spot right now, with a lot of fun contenders with a lot of good skills and varying uh, styles. And I think there's a good chance that the this division is becomes one of the most interesting divisions over the next couple of years if things shake out the right way. If John Jones only fights one more time in the next two and a half years, we could we could be in for a, a real stinker because then every it eats itself. Right? Everybody if the the title isn't changing hands, but everybody's beating each other, you know, it, the, the division loses luster and you end up with a lack of interest in the division. Moving on. Manon Fior versus Rose Namajunas. Rose Namajunas coming up to uh, flyweight. I don't know if it's for the first time in her career, but definitely for the first time in the UFC. Uh, so I, based off what I saw here, I'm not a fan of it. I don't think, especially some of the bigger girls, I, I don't know if she's going to do so hot. So nice jab and a low kick from Rose early. Fior was landing a right hand as Rose moved in kind of countering her movement. Nice counter left hand from Rose as Fior overextended. Uh, Rose was landing some really nice left hands here. A nice one-two from Fior shuts off, uh, it, and she shucked off a single-leg attempt from Rose. Uh, Rose's uh, right hand, her pinky was broken, um, it, it, or something serious happened at about like two and a half minutes into the fight. So her right hand was compromised halfway through the first round, if not earlier. And, she, you know, it, Rose just wasn't active enough in this first round. Now, looking at this, though, wow, these significant strikes, huh, that is, that is not what I saw. Was it the leg kicks that got her? Mm, okay, so that was the difference maker. Wow. So looking at the striking numbers here, Rose actually outstruck her in the first round 23 to 18. I didn't see that. That's not what I saw. And if you look at the strikes, it's the leg kicks that did it. Eight to two in favor of Nami Yunus. But if you look at the head strikes, you know, the Fior landed three more. And, you know, I feel like she did more damage anyway. I felt like she was she was definitely a lot more active. She attempted 88 strikes to uh, Nami Yunus' 56. It's not that, that that's the end-all be-all. I just thought that she did more damage. It's weird. Hmm. It's not what I saw at all. I gave, I gave Fior that first round. And then the second round here, Fior was landing some nice one twos. Uh, Rose staying in there and landing well. Fior was with a nasty clinch, uh, great short punches, uh, knees to the body. Nami Yus was still moving forward. Rose just not landing with power. Her volume still isn't there. So she needs to back her up with like a hard shot. And it just did not happen. A great left hand from Nami Yunus at one point. A clash of heads caused a nasty cut on the side of Fior's head. Uh, Fior kept her. Uh, mostly at range and throwing more often. So again, she attempted way more, 69 to 40, attempted 19 to 15 for landed strikes in favor of Fior. So I had her up 20 to 18. Last round here, Rose came out firing, uh, and she was finally, and then Fior was keeping up with her, uh, like strike for strike. Rose with a nice low kick after a failed Daketown attempt. Rose's pressure is starting to give Fior pause, but anytime she settles, Fior just starts throwing again. Uh, again, she beat her. It's total strikes here, or attempted strike 68 to 40 or 54. Uh, Rose isn't using the right hand much because of that finger being messed up. She's essentially a one handed fighter for most of this fight. And Fior starts throwing caution to the wind, blitzes forwards, landing some really good shots. And I felt like she did more damage in this round as well. Uh, she was down on the strikes 21 to 22, but I felt like she did more damage with her strikes in this round. Now, um, she did. She ends up getting the decision here. Uh, two two judges had it 29 28. Um, one judge had it 30 27. I am curious as to what round they gave her. Yep, they all gave they they gave her that last round. Interested to see why they didn't give her the first round. I mean, I, I thought it was pretty obvious to me, but looking at those numbers, I, I'm surprised nobody gave her that first round. So, what does that mean for Fior? Well, um, she's probably going to go fight for the title. <laughs> You know, she's, uh, Fior was ranked number three. Uh, she won this fight against uh, someone who's ranked number two in the strawweight division coming up. So I don't see, you know, Blandfield just had the win. So she's definitely going to be, oh man, Blandfield had a close fight though. 
Hmm. Shevchenko's taking on Grasso, so we'll see what happens there. Shevchenko wins. I don't see Grasso. Grasso could take on uh, Fior, and then Blanchfield could get the title shot, or vice versa, depending on who's healthy at the right time. So there's some options there. Interested to see how that shakes out. All right. Let's go to this absolute insanity of a fight. Good grief. Uh, Benoit saint versus Thiago Moises. Boy. Woof. That's the volume and the, the amount of damage that was thrown around here. Why Why does that keep moving? Sorry for that, guys. The screen keeps shaking up and down. Uh, low kick from Beno um, Benoit early. Uh, hard kick to the nuts from uh, Saint-Denis. So he he gets a gets a low blow for free. <laughs> Another low kick from Saint-Denis. Moises says that he got kicked there, but if you look at the uh, if you look at the replay, according to how they handled the fight earlier, which we will go over, um, this was not a low blow. Okay, I I think there is some confusion in there, and I'd have to look at the we I don't know we'd have to talk to an expert on this because based off the rules, um, a strike to the groin. I, I guess there's some leeway there because what happens if you're going down and you pull the cup? Is that still a strike to the groin? Does it have to be forward pressure? What if you pull the cup? I, I think that there's some play in that. In that, So the, the second one shouldn't have been a low kick, apparently. Uh, hard left hand uh, from Saint-Denis as he was chasing him down, landing some really hard hooks. Moises is winding up and throwing that right hand from hell. Sandini went for a takedown, got Moises to one knee, and started to land some good right hands in like that Dagestani hip ride position. A hard hooks to the body from Sandini and uh, Moises landing a right hook. So Sandini went for the takedown again, got the body lock takedown. Uh, Sandini is just staying in his face, and Moises is swinging away. And Moises gets busted up in this it's just a banger of a round. Sandini is lo uh, landing more big shots, uh, 41 to 18 for these big freaking shots in favor of Saint-Denis. Tons of damage, 10-9. Saint-Denis worked his way in with the straight left hand again and gets uh, Moises to the ground on that one knee. Starts landing some good knees to the legs, knees to the side. Saint-Denis uh, with those hard kicks, uh, to uh, hard left kicks to the body. Moises gets a double leg, but Saint-Denis gets right back up. So Moises was just overwhelmed. It's not that he was out of the fight at any point. It was just he kept... Sandini did not stop, and Moises had answers, but Sandini just pushed through it, right? Moises would land a hard left hook to the face, and Sandini would stop for half a second and then just keep throwing. So he just overwhelmed him with pressure and shots and gra a little bit of grappling in there too. Sandini is just, you know, he they started exchanging elbows in the clinch, and he got Moises down again, and Sandini got the TKO finish with just nonstop shots. Look at this. 41 strikes in the first round, 60 significant strikes landed in the second round, 60 to 6. Like, it's not that Moises didn't land shots. He did. It's just Sonda knee, just nonstop. And then after the fight, I think he spoke in French, but I think he said Gagey. I I don't think so, dude. Um, you got to wait wait your turn there or fight somebody else in the top 15. But he's he's really good. I don't. I don't see him as a title challenger um, based off the skills that I'm seeing there. He's hittable and he's got a uh, good cardio and a good shin, but um, I don't know if he has the skill set. Vulcan Uzdemir taking on Bogdan Guskov. Guskov. Another quick one, huh? Good fight for Uzdemir, huh? Good for him. Getting back on track here. Uh, both guys wade in basically clash faces almost like kiss each other as they try to land hooks and they just end up in each other's face both guys landing with Uzdemir landing the hard left hook Vulcan getting the double leg lift and dump right into half guard Guskov working his way up and Vulcan landing a little bit punishing him for standing up hard right hand from Guskov lands and Vulcan just walks through it Uzdemir landing a nice low kick Guskov doesn't like those uh Uzdemir landing a hard left hook wobbling Guskov Guskov um waves him in and tries to get him to be sloppy, right? He's like, yeah, come on, come on. And Uzdemir takes his time and lands a hard left hook that puts Guskov down. Uzdemir landed some nice ground and pound and gets the uh, rear naked choke, choke finish. I thought he looked amazing. And I know Guskov stepped up on relatively short notice. And I know this was his UFC debut, but he was a dangerous guy who hits really hard. And Uzdemir showed, you know, some uh, veteran skills and abilities in there. Good timing. The shot that he landed to put him down was so freaking good. Um, he off the slip, you know, he slips to avoid the right and then 
bam, right on the button. Just a fantastic shot from Uzdemir. Good for him. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I really mean it. I think that was an excellent fight, an excellent showcase for him. And I think he went out there and did. I don't think this raises his stock necessarily, but I think it definitely puts him in position to um, be in contention again in, or be relevant again. William Gomez versus Giannis Gamori. Boy, this fight. Some of the fights on this card, uh, especially the prelims, were stinkers. Okay, so both guys were trading low kicks. Gomez was moving into range a bit more, seeing more confidence in his strikes, seeming more confident in his striking. And then both guys were fighting like counter strikers, so it wasn't the most interesting. Uh, Gomez actually goes forward for 10 seconds to end the round and starts landing a little bit more. I thought he was winning anyway, but you know he landed more, 27 to 16 in favor of Gomez. So I, I gave him that first round anyway, 10-9. Second round here, Gomez starts the round more active, back to the double um, double counter striking fight. I mean, not not a very active round again. Look at the total striking numbers here: fourteen to eight in favor of Gomez. Right, Gomez was uh, he went for a standing guillotine at one point in this in this round, and uh, Gamori didn't really know how to fight it off, so he kind of just got stuck there. It was really awkward. Uh, it's just not a very good fight, not a fun fight to watch. I mean, even for striking aficionados, watching two counter strikers who aren't being very active and they're waiting for the other one to lead the dance can be kind of a, a grind to watch. Not that I'm a striking aficionado. I'm not. I'm a, I'm a ding-dong. Uh, so I added uh, Gomez up 20 to 18. And then the last round here, uh, Gamori in the clinch, and Gamori was pressing forward, but Gomez was staying on the outside, landing some low kicks. Gomez was landing, uh, landed a kick to the cup, and Gamori walks away, so the ref waved it off. This was a stupid ending to this fight, right? Gamori, the ref should have, the ref told him, like, continue, 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 and Gamori was turned the opposite way, and never he never got the fighter to acknowledge that he heard him. He just called off the fight because it wasn't a low blow. Now, the kick landed to the belt line and then dragged down and uh, didn't graze the cup. It pulled the cup, right? So as a fighter, I, it's hard to explain to anybody who hasn't done this, but if you ever had a cup on or if you've ever been in a situation like a grappling or a striking, if your cup gets touched during a strike, it's it's an instant reaction where it might not even be hard. It might actually, it might hurt you. But more than that, it's an acknowledgement like, oh crap, I just got kicked low or I just got punched low. I just got kneed and then whatever it is. And you, you recognize that as the person who's being fouled. Whether or not the damage was done to the cup, the fact that it was touched at all. Now, immediately afterwards, you might realize like, oh, I'm fine. But if you've ever been hit in the nuts before, you know it's a delayed reaction. Like you can get hit in the nuts, be fine for two seconds, and then all of a sudden just <sighs> like you get that feeling like you're about to throw up and it's just extremely painful. So you kind of want that pause in the action just for a second, just to make sure, right? And this happened earlier in the fight too. He did get kicked low two times earlier and the they just waved it off and then there was no review about it. So the kicks were kind of, waiting a little bit low and whether that was a legal kick or not the the situation was handled horribly i feel bad for gamori i thought he was getting out outclassed outstruck he was losing this fight absolutely i don't think they need to run it back or any of that crap forget that that being said though the way this ended was ex so unsatisfying and unsatisfactory and the way that this referee handled it um loic pora was his name uh, horrible horrible you know, no one, I don't think anybody's ever going to remember this. This was uh, one of the early fights on a card that probably not a lot of people are going to watch. And all you're going to see if this guy goes anywhere, William Gomez, that, oh, this was a win. And he got a, uh, a TKO by kicking to the body at distance is what that says. So are they going to talk about how this was controversial or they had to stop it? No, no one's going to go back and look at this crap. So. You know, it's one of those situations, it's a failing in our communication system, in our recording system, but as far as I'm concerned, it was a horrible stoppage, and it, you know, it should have been communicated better, and the guy should have been given a chance to at least turn around, because he didn't, he didn't even acknowledge, and it's on him too, like, it's, it's on him for not acknowledging the referee and turning around, but you, as that fighter, like, when your cup it gets touched, you want that second, 
You want that a couple seconds to realize. Even if you like, if the referee tells you continue, then you got to continue. But he he's like says I got kicked low. He turns around and the referee comes to step in, and you see that, and you're like, okay, I get a second. But the the referee shouldn't have stepped in at all. Then if he's gonna say continue, then what the what is he doing? Why is he stepping in there at all? It, it, his his body language, his positioning, the way he handled the situation was all wrong. Okay, blame goes to the uh, uh, Gamori obviously, because he's the guy who did it, or he's the guy um, who, you know, didn't acknowledge the referee, but absolutely the referees to blame as well. That's my, that's my piece on that one. Morgan Sharee, I think. Sharir, Sharee, it's got to be Sharee, versus Manolo Zucchini. Uh, Zucchini landed some nice low kicks, uh, uh, Morgan was landing the jab and Zucchini was countering with a one, two, three combo, which was pretty nice. Uh, let's see here. Morgan was countering a front kick with a right hand. Zucchini was more active and he was the aggressor early on, but then eventually Morgan just started to find his range, right? He was the one moving out of the way, finding his range. Then Zucchini was out of range. He just was throwing and not, not stepping in and, he landed a hard one too. Then he started to land these body kicks. Uh, Morgan did, and it made Zucchini drop, and it was over. It was those hard body kicks. He just shut his body down. Great win. Uh, great look for uh, Morgan there. So that is it for the main card. I will be covering the prelims in the next video. If you like this kind of stuff, subscribe to the channel. I appreciate you for stopping by. If you did like this video, hit the like button. I'd appreciate that. Um, and yeah, uh, let me know what you guys thought about the fights. Uh, did you watch these? Are you going to go watch these? I do recommend going to watch the main event and not because it was exciting, just because you see, to see how good Gon is, like how, how good he is when he's fighting a guy who's not good at striking and the difference and how athletic he is. It's, it's worth watching there. And then if, you know, um, seeing uh, Manon uh, Fiora versus Rose Nama Yunus, I think that's worth a watch too. And Benoit Santini, Diago Moises, that was an exciting fight, so that was for, worth watching. You know, th a lot of this main card was was fun to watch. So you know, it's one of those ones you throw it on in the background and kind of listen in, like, oh hey, what's going on when they start getting all excited. So I uh, appreciate y'all for stopping by. Love you. Have an amazing week.